Multiplex USA has sent over their Pilatus PC6 for us to assemble and also test fly for review. We're going to go ahead and walk you through that process of the assembly. Now this is an RR model, meaning receiver ready. Everything you need comes in the kit with the exception of your transmitter, your receiver, and then also your flight battery. And of course a, a battery charger as well. Um, everything else though is put together and ready to go. It's pretty handy. The level of completion is, is really quite phenomenal. Uh, they have all the control surfaces hinge. All the servos are installed on the wings, including the wing strut, carbon fiber wing uh, supports on both the main wings. Uh, the main fuselage is already put together as you see it here. I have the, the lid removed, uh, the access hatch. Horizontal stabilizer uh, with control surface hinge, the elevator. Um, when we look at uh, the uh, smaller components that are included, you have the prop spinner, the prop, and then also the collet adapter or, or the uh, prop adapter already stuck together. You're going to have to pull it apart for final assembly. Um, they include some hook and loop material for mounting the battery, and then there's also a little plastic piece. This is a strake or um, uh, uh, fin. And what, what these do on the full scale model is they're, they're vortex generators that help stabilize the uh, vertical control surfaces and uh, vertical tailplanes. Uh, ours is for aesthetics, but we're going to assemble that as one of the last steps. We'll put that in for a nice little finishing touch. Uh, only one screw. There's only one screw that you're going to have to, to install the uh, horizontal stabilizer with. They include a couple of stickers you can put on optionally if you want a little more sporty look on your Pilatus. Uh, they offer a red and blue version. Uh, perhaps on the red this would look really good. Uh, on our blue we're going to leave it off. But these just, uh, you apply the adhesive back and slip them over top of the turboprop outputs and uh, attach them to the fuselage. The fuselage is, uh, it comes very completed. In fact, these are our landing gear struts that we'll uh, see in, a, in the upcoming steps to assemble. You take off the access hatch, your ESC is already installed. They already have the brushless motor installed. And uh, they have two of the servos installed for the, for the uh, tail planes. They have the rudder and then also the elevator servo. And the neat thing about the kit is all the linkage is hidden. So you don't see servos and wires on the outside of the aircraft at all uh, for all control surfaces. So it makes a really clean finished product. Uh, there is another ox, uh, access hatch in the bottom of the aircraft. It's magnetic, so you can get in there and remove that. And that gives you access to your elevator and your rudder servo. So let's go ahead and get started with our assembly. Um, one tip I can give you up front, we've assembled a lot of multiplex models over the years. And uh, what you're going to find is their directions have several languages. So as you flip through, you'll see, uh, you'll get to the English section if you're English speaking, of course. And uh, then you'll keep flipping through and find the actual pictures that are referenced in the instructions. So you can save yourself some hassle. In the very center of the book is, uh, is one uh, page or one page's worth of, uh, of images on both sides. You can pry open the staples, pop that out, and then if you get to the uh, instructions for your language, just take a small razor knife and cut that page out, and you'll find that, at least on the English directions, it, uh, it condenses down to a two-sided page. And now I have my graphics and my instructions side by side, a little easier than having to flip back and forth in the book. So let's go ahead and get started. Our first step is going to be attaching the uh, landing gear assembly to the fuselage. You'll notice that the wing struts are already mounted from the factory. Um, all we're going to have to do is loosen up the screw and rotate these down to the vertical position. Repeat that on the other side. And you'll notice that there are springs you know, wrapped in some, some foam, protective foam to keep it in place. Just take your razor knife and gently cut the tape away. And then peel away that outer covering to expose the spring. Now we're going to install the landing gear. You'll see two slots there and there. The aft, far aft slot is if you uh, install the optional floats. So the landing gear, we're just going to concentrate on the two front slots. And what you're going to do is um, you'll see a protective plastic piece on one of the struts, uh, uh, insert points, and the other one will be unprotected. You're going to take the plastic and put it towards the front. And at the same time, feed your struts into the landing gear. With everything lined up and everything in its pockets, you're going to go ahead and push the landing gear into the receivers on the fuselage and you'll hear it click when it's seated fully. There we go. And now our landing gear is attached. Next we're going to attach our horizontal stabilizer and elevator. And in, in order to, to make it easier to uh, connect the linkage before we slide it in place, we need to remove this lower access hatch and then access the lower servo here. We're going to go ahead and back the screw off just slightly on that linkage connector. And that'll allow free movement of our linkage rod, which is going to make it a lot easier to slip that horizontal stabilizer in place. With our connector loose now on the linkage, we can move the control rod back and forth very easily. And you can go ahead and pull it out a little ways. You can always refeed it back through the, uh, the linkage back up the servo. And uh, what we're going to do is insert it through the control horn for the, uh, for the elevator. And you'll see a slight sleeve that's pushed through on the third position from the root. We're going to go ahead and slide the rod through that sleeve.
And now with the control linkage in place and maintaining proper orientation as it was when it was uh, when it came from the factory, you want the hook looking from the back, you want the hook of the linkage to go off to the left. And since there's no free movement, that linkage can't slip off during flight. Now we're going to go ahead and feed it uh, into the tail service. Just pay attention to the slot. It's uh, located right here on the horizontal stabilizer, and you're going to see a corresponding uh, rod coming down through, which is actually attaches to your uh, uh, to your rudder. There's a sleeve that protects that control linkage. You're going to slide this around that sleeve and make sure it's firmly seated. With everything in place, ensure that you have free movement of your elevator. And in fact, now's a good time to kind of flex that foam a little bit. It tends to be a little stiff from the factory, even though it's pre-cut. You just want to give it plenty of uh, free movement on the servos so you aren't overworking your servos. Make sure it moves freely with no binding at all. Now I'm ready to put in the, um, the one screw that holds the horizontal stabilizer in place and then run the screw in with a screwdriver. You don't want to take it too tight just to where it feels like it's getting a good firm grasp on the uh, horizontal stabilizer because you can actually start dimpling the uh, foam. We don't want to do that. And when it's installed, Make sure that the screw is not uh, protruding past the actual receiver and horizontal stabilizer. It should not stick past there at all. Now the instructions will tell you at this point to go ahead and center your radio your servo, but I'm going to go ahead and wait. Since I have access to my servo, I'm going to go ahead and wait and just gently uh, apply a little bit of pressure on the screw, make sure that it's just holding it in place, it doesn't slip out. And then after we get our radio system initialized, I'm going to go back through and uh, recenter those servos on the linkage uh, with my sub trims. The instructions have us putting on our prop and spinner at this point, but since we're going to be making a lot of radio adjustments and messing around with the electronics, we don't want a live and dangerous power plant on the bench. So we're going to go ahead and leave the prop and spinner off for now. We can easily get to it, so we'll put it on at the very end. Our next step is to install the wings. We're going to be using a few things. The wings themselves, we're going to be uh, attaching the wing uh, support rods or struts. We're also going to be using a connecting rod uh, that comes along with us. A carbon fiber rod slips right through the channel you see here on the side of the fuselage. That holds our wings uh, in place. We also have anti-rotation pins. Now I'm going to give you a little tip uh, on the anti-rotation pins. These are, these are very, very uh, sharp cut carbon fiber, which is fine. But when you try to feed them into the anti-rotation sockets, when you're putting the wing together, it can be a little difficult. So I'd go ahead and dry fit them first. Just line the anti-rotation pin up with the uh, a corresponding receiver and just kind of get it positioned. I'm doing it in the blind here so you can't see, but I just kind of get it positioned and then rotate it a little bit until I can get the uh, rod to slip in the receiver. As you can see here, it's taken a few tries. And that's without restrictions. There we go. Now I've got it just slipped in a little bit. And you can go ahead and rotate it back and forth just to kind of free up that, that uh, receiver a little bit. It's going to make it easier when you actually do assemble the wings. So what we're going to want to do is uh, take our, or free up our radio connections. We have our flap and aileron servo. You're going to notice these numbered. We'll go ahead and cover that a little bit later on. We'll give you the, the key as to, well, uh, if you're connecting in mode 2, which is popular here in the U.S., how you're going to want to connect those. But you're going to see uh, uh, a small passageway on the side of the fuselage. Go ahead and, and put the wires through there and then slide the wing in place. So now that our wing is close to inserted, we're going to go ahead and put the, uh, the uh, support rod through and into the wing. Line that up. You can rotate a little bit. It'll go in a little bit easier. Make sure your radio connections, which mine were, make sure they're not getting pinched between the fuselage and the wing itself. It's kind of a tight fit right there. Go ahead and use your finger to push it in and make sure it's clear when you insert the, uh, the wing itself. The wing should seat firmly against the fuselage, which mine has. And now we're ready to connect the uh, wing support. Line up the support and put the keeper back in. On the underside of each wing, you're going to notice a small Phillips screw that's located there and also the same place on the other side. Uh, once you slide everything together, get your wing supports in place, uh, have, make sure that your wing is fully seated. Now you can go ahead and tighten these up a little bit. You're just going to want to put a little bit of pressure on that, uh, that uh, joining rod. And what this does is clamps the wing down on the joining rod not too tight, you don't want to crush it, you just want to make sure it has a little bit of purchase. And this will secure your wings to the joining rod and make sure that they don't come off or get loose in flight. This is where a little pre-planning kicks in. Um, if you look at the ESC and the connector that ships with it, this is an M6 connector, not terribly popular with a lot of battery manufacturers and kind of hard to find here in the U.S. especially. Um, we're going to go ahead and replace this connector with the a connector with, the, with ample rating. This is just a Dean's Ultra plug. 
We're going to go ahead and switch over to that so we can use our, our library of flight batteries that, that are compatible with this model. Now is the time to do that. You're going to go ahead and remove the uh, ESC. It's on some hook and loop tape. Just pull it off. And then make note of the uh, wire connections if you can. Worst case, um, if the motor is going in the opposite direction or the wrong direction, by switching any one of the three connected wires. So you could connect them in any order. If it's going the wrong way, just swap two of the wires, any two, doesn't matter, uh, and it'll switch direction on the ESC. Uh, we're going to go ahead and just pull it off and uh, try our luck when we put it back together. If it needs to be switched, I'll just switch two of the wires. In addition to our connector that we're going to change out, we're going to be using the Optima 7 receiver from high tech and one of the neat features of the Optima 7 is it has an SPC port and this is supplemental power connection. What that allows us to do, it ships with this little connector in the bag. So what we're going to do is um, solder that onto our main flight lead or our main battery lead on the ESC. So we're going to go ahead and pigtail this out of our replacement connector. So it'll actually be like this in the end. We have a little lead, looks like a radio lead, uh, coming off of the main flight pack. This then gets plugged into the SPC port on the uh, Optima 7. And the reason we do that is because we're able then with our Aurora 9X we're going to be using, or the Aurora 9 or the Optic 6 Sport, uh, with telemetry, any, a lot of the, the uh, telemetry capable or telemetry built-in radios from high tech, we're able to monitor our main flight pack voltage. So as we're flying along, we actually have a gas gauge on our transmitter that tells us our battery is getting kind of low and it's time for us to land. So now that I've soldered on the connector that I want to use and pigtailed in my SPC port lead, my ESC is ready to be, to be reinstalled. Now again, you don't have to do this if you're just running with a standard uh, installation or receiver that doesn't support these functions. Now we've decided to go ahead and run our radio connections up to the center of the fuselage, and since our Optima 7 will actually fit into the slot, we're going to go ahead and fix it that way inside the fuselage. Um, this keeps our radio connection, our antenna, uh, running towards the aft of the aircraft. Uh, it'll stay away from um, uh, the power connections down in the nose of the aircraft and give us the best possible uh, signal. Now you can alternatively, or I guess that would be the alternative method, you can follow the instructions and also mount it in front of the aircraft, uh, pulling all of the connections forward into the compartment here, making all your radio connections and then affixing it up inside. You see to mount it on the other side of the wing with some double-sided sticky tape. So you're going to have to use some sort of push rod or something to get it to stick, to place the tape and get it to stick up above as well. So uh, you have a couple options there for mounting. They generally want you to stick the radio in this uh, center section of the aircraft, though, uh, to keep it away from the power connections. Regardless of which way you do, up front or the uh, center fuselage mounting location, um, you're still going to have to deal with the channel numbers on the connectors as they are assigned to the receiver. Now, on our high-tech Optima receiver, they just put in numbers. They don't put in throttle and, and elevator and rudder and things like that. But the uh, channel assignments are the same on mode 2. In the U.S., uh, channel 1 is aileron, channel 2 is elevator, channel 3 is uh, throttle, and channel 4 is rudder. And then you use the additional channels to connect your flap or secondary, uh, secondary aileron servo. This first connection we see is the one that I put in uh, for the SPC port since we're going to use that function on a receiver. So it wouldn't apply if you're not using that uh, type of receiver connection. Um, you'll also see a different colored wire here. All of these match. This one's a different color. I actually put an extension, a small 12-inch uh, extension, on the uh, ESC so I could run. It has a very short lead on it, so I could run that ESC comfortably back to the uh, receiver location. So we're going to go ahead and uh, identify each of the control surface servos. And uh, we'll start with one. Now, one they have assigned to aileron, which is fine, so that's a correct mapping. And you'll notice that uh, receivers are typically keyed. You'll have a little, a little tab. That indicates the data, uh, which is yellow or white, depending on the manufacturer's connection you're using. Um, so we're going to look at the, uh, the brown or the black wire as the negative, and you always put that away from the little tab across all your radio connections since this shares the same power bus. So we're going to take the negative of uh, channel 1 and put it into the channel 1 slot. Channel 2 is uh, for our elevator, and that's fine. So we're going to go ahead and take channel 2 and put it in channel 2. Now, channel 3 and 4 were reversed. So um, it, it reversed meaning they were set up for mode 1 versus mode 2. So the identification we're going to be flying in the United States is mode 2. So we want our throttle, or our ESC for engine control, connected to channel 3. So we're going to go ahead and put uh, my extension that I put on here into channel 3. And then we're going to look for the number three because that's what they had originally identified the rudder as being. But in fact, on our configuration, it's channel four. So there's channel three. 
we're going to put 3 into 4. And as you go along, make sure your polarity is correct on all these connections. It's very easy to get concentrated on which one goes where, and then when you get it finished and you get it all in place, something's not functioning. Nine times out of ten, that's what happened is you just reverse the connection. So then we're going to continue through. Uh, channel 5 is going to be our second aileron servo. So we'll look for 5. There we go. 5 is going to go into 5. Now, we're using a 7-channel receiver, so what you could do is... Uh, take the ailerons, which I plugged into channel 1, you can take channel 1 and channel 5 and put those on a Y adapter and run those both into channel 1 and that'd be fine. Since our flap servo orientation is not reversed, uh, we would run into a scenario if we wide off our flaps, they would move in opposite directions. So without a reversing Y adapter, what your best bet is is to stick with a six channel minimum receiver so you can, you can hook up a, a channel for each of the flaps and then you can Y off the uh, ailerons if you so choose to and still have enough channels left for our throttle and our elevator and rudder. So we're going to continue through uh, channel 6. We should have. We've got 6. We're going to put that into the corresponding channel. This is going to be our first flap servo. And channel 7 is going to go into channel 7. Now on my, my radio connection, my setup, I'm going to go ahead and use my SPC port. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and plug into that SPC port, which is, again, going to give me my battery level at the transmitter so I can set a, set a little threshold and it'll warm me when my battery starts getting low. So what I'm going to do now is feed this up inside the fuselage. I already have one side of the uh, uh, hook and loop material on the receiver. I'm going to take the opposite side, put a little pad of it at the bottom uh, with my finger, and then feed the receiver up inside, and then using a small piece of wire, I'll go ahead and hook the receiver in and get good compression on the hook and loop material. Um, well, it will save you a lot of headaches either way, whether you go front mount or center fuselage mount on your receiver, is uh, just getting a piece of wire, bending a little hook in it, that's going to help you reach inside the fuselage and pull those wires around. Before you fasten your receiver into the, the model and get it up into the location you want it in, make sure that everything is connected properly. We want to check the, uh, the, the functionality of each of the control surfaces. Uh, right stick to the right and left, you want the outermost control surfaces on the wings, these are called the ailerons, you want those moving in opposite directions. So we'll focus again on the, on the proper direction. Since I went ahead and went with a seven channel receiver, each of these is connected independently into the radio system, which allows me to trim each one independently, reverse each one independently, so it makes it a lot more flexible for the installation. Uh, flaps, in this particular case, uh, just connecting it up to the Aurora 9X, it automatically assigned my flaps to my uh, left slider and I can see that my flaps are functioning. Those should be both moving up and down as you move whatever control server or uh, input on the radio that moves the flaps. Left stick up and down is going to be our throttle control and I've already verified that I got the right direction and I have the proper direction after I uh, change my connector. So we should see or hear movement on that motor when we move the left stick up and down. So right stick to the uh, uh, up and down is moving my elevator. When I pull down on my right stick it should deflect up, which it does. So this is moving in the correct direction, my elevator is. Push forward, it should move down. And then on the left stick, if I move left and right, left should move the rudder to the left, which it does, and right moves it to the right. So these are moving in the correct directions, no reversing necessary. Now let's go ahead and get them trimmed up as they need to be. If we loosen the two screws on the servos uh, located underneath this back access hatch, we can go ahead and move the linkage now by hand. So the servo on the right moves the elevator. The servo on the left moves the rudder. What we're going to want to do first is take a close look at our servos and using the sub trim adjustments on a radio if they're present, if you have a computer radio, we're going to want to make those servo horns perfectly uh, uh, par or perpendicular to the body of the servo. So we want a 90 degree angle from the servo to the servo horn. So my, my Aurora 9X, I'm going to go into the uh, settings, I'm going to go into uh, sub trim, I'm going to go into uh, channel 4 which is my rudder, I'm going to go ahead and adjust it then, and I want this servo to show 90 degrees. You can see as I sub-trim it, it'll move beyond 90 degrees, and we're looking at this servo right here. As I go the opposite direction, it'll reflect the opposite, the opposite way off of 90 degrees. So we want to stop that servo to work right at 90 degrees. In this particular servo's case too, they mounted it a little bit crooked from the factory, so we're going to focus on 90 degrees off of the actual control linkage rod itself. And that's pretty close. Now we're going to go ahead and adjust our uh, elevator the same way. We'll go into the uh, sub trim and we'll look at the elevator, which is channel 2, there we go, and we'll adjust it. Let's 
going in the wrong direction, so I'll hit the opposite direction. And that looks pretty good. That's about 90 degrees on both of those. So we'll go ahead and exit out of our sub trim. Now using a small amount of uh, thread locker, we're going to use blue thread locker from BSI. And that's our transmitter reminding us that our system's on but not active. We're going to go ahead and apply a tiny bit of blue thread locker so these screws don't back out in flight. And then reinsert the screw. So what we'll do, starting with the elevator, we'll go ahead and make sure that it's visually level with the horizontal stabilizer. And then we'll tighten up that set screw. We'll repeat that process on the rudder, make sure that it's uh, completely parallel with the uh, vertical stabilizer. And then we'll tighten up the set screw on that as well. So now our elevator and our rudder are both centered. The horns are parallel or 90 degrees to the uh, control linkage. And uh, we fastened down the linkage on both of those control surfaces. The nice thing about that is, is our, our actual trims for those channels are setting dead neutral. So we have full adjustment in the air as opposed to having done a, a bunch of trimming to try to get things to level out without doing this, this preparatory step. So our, uh, our two tail surfaces are ready. So now we can move on to our ailerons. If we look at our ailerons, when we take our right stick to the right in mode two, the right aileron should go up, deflecting the right wing down. That's a turn to the or bank to the right. Um, likewise, stick to the left should take the left aileron up. So these are reversed right now. But we're going to go into our settings and uh, we're going to look at uh, reverse. We're going to hit reverse and focus on our two aileron channels. Since I'm using a seven channel receiver, I have two aileron channels. Uh, aileron 1, which is channel 1, and AL2, as it's indicated on channel 5. These are both set normal, so I'm going to go in and reverse it. Yes, I want to reverse it. Same with the other one. Reverse it. Yes, I want to reverse it. Exit out of that. Now when we look at our ailerons, they're moving in the correct direction. So right stick to the right, right aileron goes up, left aileron goes down, left, or right stick to the left, left aileron goes up, and right aileron goes down. So this is correct. Adjusting our ailerons uh, and using some sort of reference point, since ailerons go both up and down, it's kind of difficult in this particular circumstance to see center. Um, what we're going to do is reference the, the, about the last two inches of the trailing edge of the main wing. We're going to draw a straight line from there to the bottom of the aileron. And you can see uh, it's down a little bit. It dips down. So if we, if we reference those last couple inches, uh, we can see our aileron dipping down below that. So we want to adjust that in the sub trim. What we're going to do, and just like we did with our elevator, we're going to go ahead and go into the sub trim menu. Um, if you don't know what that is and, the, and you're using the Aurora 9, you can go into your main menu and then go into sub trim. And uh, you're going to see aileron. There's our elevator and our rudder that we already sub trimmed. Aileron 1 and 2. So our right aileron is on aileron 2. Our left aileron is connected to aileron uh, 1. So we're going to go into aileron 2. We're going to go ahead and adjust that until it looks like it's level. If you go the wrong way, Model's tipping a little bit on us. If you go the wrong way, just go in the opposite direction until you see it. There we go. Leveling out with the rest of the wing. So now we've got a pretty good reference line going on uh, on our aileron. You can always take it back a little bit until it visually matches that bottom edge. So now we've got a pretty straight and true aileron on the right-hand side. That'll be great for first flights. We can always do slight adjustments with the uh, trim in air if we're uh, banking to the right or to the left. We're going to go ahead and repeat this on the opposite side for aileron one. Now with our flaps adjusted and trimmed properly to where they're smooth with our ailerons on both sides, we're going to do one last step on the flaps, uh, which is really about the longevity and the lifespan of your servos. We're going to look at the EPA or endpoint adjustment. And uh, this may seem a little elusive to some people if you've never messed with it, but all it does is sets the end point of the servo for the maximum throw. Since we're using a slider for our flaps, um, I really don't have a you know, click switch that sets those positions. So I've got full deflection, I've got full retraction, and then I've got a click or a detent in the middle that gives me about, you know, about my 40 degree uh, deflection. Um, I'm going to adjust that total position uh, later according to the manual and according to my flying pre preference, but you want max is 90 and minimum, of course, being uh, completely retracted. So as we look at um, what takes place at the fully extended position, what I'm finding is that when I extend these fully, 
I'm getting a little bit of a servo growl or grind, some resistance in the servo without any movement really noticeably on the, uh, on the, the actual flap. So what I want to do is back it off slightly. I'll notice my, my flap servos will quiet down and they're not chattering at all. Um, I want to go ahead and adjust those flaps to where my max deflection then is at 90. I can do that by the endpoint adjustment. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and go into full deflection. I'll go into uh, EPA as my adjustment. And then I'm going to look at my, uh, my different uh, options here. Elevator throttle rudder, aileron 2, page 2 we're going to switch over to. And we're going to look at flap 1. So here's flap 1. If I hit both of those, I don't want that. I want the uh, low adjustment. If I move my stick, I can see that high is up all the way. If I move it to low, it switches over to low. So I know low is the adjustment I want. So I've got it 100%. I'm going to go ahead and back that slightly off until my servo stops growling. There we go. So I'm going to switch over to flap 2 on my low point adjustment. And there we go. My servo is not binding anymore. So my servos are free moving within the range. So when I do full flap deflection, I have quiet, uh, quiet servos and good deflection on my flaps themselves. That's EPA. It's a pretty quick and easy way to really extend the life of your servos. Because when they're sitting there binding, they're just getting hotter and hotter. And it ends up burning out the, uh, the motors a lot faster on them. So now I've got everything pretty well set from direction and throw and everything else. Now I move on to my deflections as recommended on high rates and low rates. And then dial in any expos that I may want. In preparation for the very last step, which is our balancing, while we've got the aircraft uh, up on the stand, we're going to go ahead and mark back 58 millimeters from the wing leading edge. And we're going to make a dot. This is going to be our reference mark when we go to balance our aircraft at the field. So we'll go ahead and put that on this wing and go ahead and do it on the opposite wing as well. And now we have reference marks to put our fingers. So we know for sure after putting in a fresh battery, our aircraft is going to balance out properly for safe flight. The next step is to install the hook and loop material they provided in the kit for our battery. And if you already have flight batteries, just make sure you use the side that corresponds with the battery you're going to be using, or the opposite side rather. In this case, I'm going to be using the soft uh, sided hook and loop. And what we're going to do is place this up on the, uh, in the fuselage right in this area. So we've got plenty of placement range uh, for our battery itself. So we'll stick that right to the foam underneath these wires. And then uh, what I'm also going to do is use a little bit of uh, adhesive. In fact, uh, it works extremely well on, on Elipor, which is expanded polyolefin uh, foam, is just regular medium uh, cyanoacrylator or a CA glue from your hobby dealer. So I'm going to go ahead and tack the corners after I peel the adhesive uh, cover off the back. I'll tack the corners and stick it down on the foam, and that'll, that'll make sure that it stays in place as I remove the battery and put it back in multiple times. Now it's time to install our prop and prop spinner. We're going to go ahead and back the screws off of the, uh, of the spinner cone from the back plate. And now with the spinner cone removed, we're going to go ahead and slide the, um, the collet type prop adapter all the way onto the motor shaft. And you want it to seat all the way to the back. And using an adjustable wrench, go ahead and tighten the uh, nut down against the prop. Make sure that the prop spinner is even against the back plate all the way around. Our last step is install the strake on the top of the aircraft. Now the label actually covers up where it goes. You'll see a small uh, protrusion or bump in the wing. And then there's a, a um, kind of an oval shaped platform right here. That's where the strake goes. So you're going to go ahead and cut that away using your hobby knife. And then dry fit the strake in place to make sure it fits properly. which it does. And now all we need to do is apply a little bit of medium CA into that slot that we've just opened up with our knife. Make sure you install it with the uh, pointed edge pointing towards the tail of the plane. Insert the front edge and then push it firmly into place. And it should look like that when you're finished. Let's make sure that it's straight. And then just allow that to dry for a good 20 minutes or so before you go for a test flight. Okay, the very last step is to level out your model. You're going to use those reference points that we put on the bottom of the wing earlier at 58, 58 millimeter from the leading edge. I'm using a Great Plains CG machine to uh, balance ours out just so I can talk and, and show you what, what the angle should be. Um, what you're going to want to achieve with your Pilatus is a slightly nose down angle. So this is level with the aircraft. When I release it, 
it settles out to a slightly nose down or forward CG. This gives us the most stability in the air. It takes, a while, it takes away a lot of the twitchiness or, or the, uh, the tendency to porpoise or be very aerobatic. Um, it has plenty of lift area on the wing, so slight forward nose uh, down CG is the best for your initial takeoffs and flight. As you get used to the Pilatus, and how you achieve the CG is by moving your battery fore and aft. So I've, you want all up weight. You want everything installed on the aircraft as if you're ready to fly it, including the flight battery inside. Um, and then you just move it forward. If you want the nose to tip down more, you move it forward. If you're trying to get better, you know, a better balance, if your uh, um, if your uh, uh, way nose forward and it really wants to tip down, you can move your battery back, and that will shift that balance back to where it'll bring it into a settle into a nice slightly nose down uh, attitude on the balancing stand, or using your fingers on those two reference marks. So, anytime you change a battery, if you use a different milliamp, higher capacity, that's going to add a little bit more weight. You're going to re want to re-verify that CG before you take the first flight. So that's why we put the dots on the bottom of the wing. As you get out there at the field and you put a new battery pack in. Put your fingers on the two dots and make sure the model balances out with you know, slightly nose forward down angle. Um, as you get more and more used to the Pilatus, and you may want to do a little more aerobatic maneuvers with it, it's okay to back that CG off or move your, your weight backwards a little bit, your battery placement, to where you get about level or slightly nose forward but more level a CG. What you want to avoid at all times, and we're actually catching on the, um, on the uh, struts here, is you want to avoid a tail heavy, so I'll go ahead and scoot it back in the bracket. You don't want the, the Pilatus's tail to ever be da hanging down when you go to check the balance. That creates an extremely unstable scenario and will most likely result in a crash. So you want, uh, at, for most aerobatic capabilities, level, slightly nose forward for best handling, best takeoff, best, uh, best landing uh, uh, performance and feel. If you'd like more information on the Pilatus PC6, in the United States you can go to hightechrcd.com. Internationally, you can go to multiplex-rc.de for pricing, availability, and also the available accessories for the Platus. I'm Kurt with Two Brothers Hobby. Good luck, and thanks for watching.